Charles and I'm one of the surgeons at South Pole's. Uh, trying to get the YouTube um, video to work. But anyway, here we are. So uh, today I'm going to talk about laryngeal paralysis. And the reason why I'm talking about laryngeal paralysis is that in the Southern Hemisphere, laryngeal paralysis is much more common at this time of year because we're coming into um, uh, summer. And so it's hotter and um, and more humid and that kind of thing. And so also patients or dogs are more likely to be outside exercising and that kind of thing. So uh, that is why we see it more frequently here. So laryngeal paralysis is a fairly common condition and we see it most often in large breed dogs. And kind of the classic uh, is uh, a 10 year old, Labrador retriever. And that's what we see very frequently, but any breed can be affected. Again, most commonly, it's going to be in large, uh, large breed dogs that are over the age of 10. Clinical signs that we're going to see with laryngeal paralysis are going to be um, inspiratory strider, and uh, noise and breathing. So that's the strider. Also difficulty breathing, so dyspnea. Um, and often these are characterized by kind of a roaring clinical sign where you see <laughs> that kind of thing. I'm just gonna check the stream to see uh, how many people we have on board. Um, and just, I apologize that there is a delay of about 10 to 20 seconds between what I'm saying and what's coming out on YouTube. And so if I don't answer your question straight away, that would be why. Uh, the other thing that we see in dogs with laryngeal paralysis is a voice change frequently in the weeks and months leading up to the development of the clinical signs. And then we also can see a generalized weakness. And the reason why we see generalized weakness is because the peripheral neuropathy that's going on with the larynx um, also uh, can affect other peripheral nerves in the body. And so you can, you can see things like CP or conscious proprioceptive deficits. Uh, you can see ataxia, uh, knuckling, uh, those types of things. And so interestingly, as far as the weakness and the neurologic deficits are concerned, about 90 to 95% of dogs will develop, if they don't have it at the time of initial presentation, will develop weakness and signs of peripheral neuropathy by 12 months. So that's something that we always warn our owners about that. Um, and I apologize that I need to write a little bit higher on the screen. Um, anyway, 90 to 95% of dogs are going to develop uh, weakness in the 12 months uh, after diagnosis. And so owners need to be warned about that as a possibility. All right, so we've got a kind of older uh, dog, 10 years of age plus, generally large breed. Uh, often we see clinical signs of inspiratory dyspnea, voice change, weakness, uh, decreased tolerance to heat and exercise. And one thing that we see these dogs present with um, uh, frequently is hyperthermia. And that can actually be the cause of death in a lot of these patients, particularly when it's really hot outside is that they can't pet and so they can't get rid of the, the heat. And so uh, they succumb to the, um, to the heat stroke, uh, basically with this condition. Now, diagnostic tests that we use for laryngeal paralysis, well, the first thing is going to be our history. So our classic history and signalment. Uh, which is consistent with laryngeal paralysis. And that's gonna make our diagnosis in the majority of patients or, or be very, very supportive of our diagnosis in the majority of patients. Physical examination, uh, we're going to look for um, the classic uh, uh, respiratory strider and stertorous breathing. Sometimes you'll see cyanosis. Um, that's usually a bad sign. Often we can hear these dogs walking into the front of the clinic. So you hear that really pronounced breathing uh, noise uh, that we see. Uh, you want to question the history of, um, of cyanosis, history of collapse. Often they're worse with heat 
and exercise and a really important clinical sign that we want to inquire about is vomiting or history is vomiting or regurgitation. Um, and that's important for two reasons. Number one, it could be a sign of something like myasthenia gravis, uh, which is causing mega esophagus. So you'd wanna be aware of that. And the other issue is um, that if you have pre-existing vomiting and regurgitation, the risk of aspiration pneumonia postoperatively is astronomical. So if you have a dog that's vomiting or regurgitating prior to surgery, and then you do surgery, the risk of postoperative uh, aspiration pneumonia is astronomical and with a quite a high uh, risk of mortality as well. So that's something that we're gonna really want to inquire about uh, when we are examining these patients. So uh, again, the main diagnostic test that we're gonna use is history, signalment, physical examination, history of cyanosis, history of collapse, worse with heat and exercise. Uh, wanna look at a, um, a history of vomiting and regurgitation, and these are usually progressive and happen frequently in spring and early summer. All right, so how are we gonna make a definitive diagnosis or what kind of diagnostic tests that we are gonna do? Um, so, uh, and, I, and I didn't mention this before, in physical examination, we are gonna palpate the neck region to make sure that there aren't any uh, obvious masses or anything like that. So as far as tests are, gonna con uh, uh, are concerned, we're gonna wanna do blood work um, because most of these patients are geriatric. Uh, so we're gonna wanna assess whether there's any uh, pre-existing kidney or liver uh, deficits or anything like that, because we're gonna be anesthetizing them for the, uh, the most part. Also looking for an elevation of white blood cell count that could be consistent with aspiration pneumonia. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take thoracic radiographs, but be careful that we um, don't stress these patients in case they're already in severe respiratory distress. And so we're not gonna hold this patient down for a thoracic radiograph if it's already struggling to breathe. Um, if you have a patient that's in severe respiratory distress um, and we don't wanna stress it by taking blood and thoracic radiographs, then we're gonna do emergency management. And the emergency management is gonna uh, include oxygenation, sedation, cooling, and possibly steroids, uh, rapid acting steroids to reduce inflammation in the, um, uh, in the larynx. Now remember that if you sedate them with anything and then you try to do a laryngeal examination, that sedation is going to affect laryngeal function. And so you might not be able to definitively diagnose laryngeal paralysis. So if you sedate these dogs and then you do a laryngeal exam, your laryngeal function is going to be artifactually affected. All right, so remember that. Now this is the emergency management. And remember that all the clinical signs of laryngeal paralysis will be completely resolved with intubation. And so if you have a patient that's really crashing and burning and you're really concerned that it's going to die, um, just knock it, you know, get an IV catheter into it, knock it out and intubate it. And then you can resolve the, pyre or the hypothermia um, and you've got some time to assess whether it has aspiration pneumonia, get them, you know, get them cooled down, that kind of thing, get them out of the crisis situation. And then you can come back and do the, the, the uh, proper assessment the next day when the patient is out of the critical situation. Rarely is a laryngeal tieback an emergency procedure. So you want to stabilize them first. Just looking over here to see what the question is. Uh, there's a question about so uh, choking while eating and drinking um, and whether that can be a clinical sign. And it certainly can be if you have laryngeal paralysis, particularly if you have a dog that's really struggling to breathe and it's kind of battling between breathing and eating um, that, uh, uh, that sometimes it will choke and gag while it's eating. All right, so we've done blood work. Um, 
uh, so we've managed the emergency patient. If it's not an emergency patient, then we can go uh, into blood work and thoracic radiographs. Now, what are we going to look for on thoracic radiographs? So with thoracic radiographs, why are we doing this? Well, the main reason is, number one, we want to look for evidence of pneumonia if it's pre-existing, because pre-existing pulmonary uh, um, or uh, pneumonia prior to surgery is a big predictor of post-operative pneumonia as well. So we want to be aware of that because that's going to affect our prognosis. Number two, we are looking for mega esophagus, which would be um, number one, consistent potentially with myasthenia gravis, and number two, um, could predict post-operative regurgitation and aspiration pneumonia. Now, um, the other thing that we're gonna look for is if there are any masses in the chest, uh, uh, in the uh, thoracic trachea, lungs, et cetera, which would potentially affect the prognosis. So an owner would wanna know if there was malignant neoplasia um, in the chest cavity. Um, also, you'd want to take cervical radiographs uh, because we are looking for a mass in the larynx or in the uh, cervical trachea, foreign body, uh, for in, sorry, misspelled, foreign body, uh, and is that off the bottom? So mass in the larynx, I'm just seeing what you can see, uh, trachea, and then also potential for a foreign body. Got another question over here. So apparently the quality of the uh, audio is not very good. And I'm sorry, I don't know how to move it. Let me see what the, no, it's, I guess it's peeking out a little bit. Let me just move it away from my, Voice. Just let me know if that uh, audio is any better right now. I can also turn down the... Uh, all right, so let's see if that's any better. Anyway, so we've done our thoracic radiographs. We've done our blood work. Now, the definitive diagnosis of aspiration pneumonia is based on uh, laryngeal examination. Now, when we do a laryngeal examination, the type of anesthetic that we use for that is very, very important. And so the first thing is that we don't do any, so no pre-med. So any of the sedations, so any sedation is going to artifactually reduce laryngeal function. So if you use any kind of sedation, you're going to um, get false positives for laryngeal paralysis. Okay, so I just another comment that the audio appears to be better. So you don't want any sedation in these patients. Just cut it color that in red, so no pre-med. Now, when I was growing up as a young surgeon, the only anesthetic, injectable anesthetic that you could use for these patients was thiopental IV. And you'd want them to be very lightly anesthetized and you want them basically fighting the anesthesia. So you're actually kind of wrestling them as you're uh, examining, because you want them as light as they can possibly be. Okay, um, let me just see, audio is a lot better. I think that it was just peeking out because I was speaking too loud. Um, so we used to use just thiopental IV, remembering that if you extravasate thiopental that you're gonna get um, a burn and a slough. And so you wanna be really, really careful making sure that your catheter is in place. And you definitely wanna do this through a catheter, not through just a needle into the vein. 
Now, you can also use alfaxanone or alfaxan and propofol, but you still want to make sure that they are very light on the anesthetic when you do the examination. Now, if you do not have adequate movement of the laryngeal cartilages, or if you, you it, it's not definitive whether you have um, laryngeal paralysis or not, you can administer doxapram. And doxapram is a stimulant which will increase laryngeal function if the laryngeal function is normal. And so if you have a dog with laryngeal paralysis, the doxapram is not going to help. Whereas if you have a patient that has laryngeal paralysis and you're having trouble determining whether you're getting movement or not, you can administer doxapram and that's going to enhance your laryngeal function. If it's still paralyzed, even with doxapram and a light thiopental or propofol or alfaxin anesthetic, then you can definitively make your diagnosis of laryngeal paralysis. Now, after we've confirmed our diagnosis, we usually, so uh, once we've confirmed diagnosis, we usually um, take these guys straight to surgery. So confirmed diagnosis, straight to surgery. And so in that case, if we're going straight to surgery, we then administer a low dose acepromazine and a low dose butorphanol because the, that's gonna make the anesthetic smoother. So after we've made our diagnosis, then we can administer um, a low dose of sedation in the form of acepromazine and butorphanol. And the use of a partial agonist like butorphanol or buprenorphine significantly reduces the incidence of aspiration, aspiration pneumonia postoperatively when you compare with a full agonist like morphine. So I do not believe in using a full agonist like morphine or methadone in my um, laryngeal paralysis patients um, as a pre-med or as pain relief afterward. I only like using partial agonists because that's going to re reduce our respiratory depression and reduce the pharyngeal relaxation that you can get with those medications. So again, once we confirm a diagnosis, if we're going straight to surgery, I will give them a pre-med quote unquote of acepromazine uh, and butorphanol. If you're not going to go straight to surgery, then you can just wake the patient up, recognizing that whenever you anesthetize a patient <clears throat> for laryngeal paralysis, you run the risk of aspiration pneumonia. And so you're gonna to wanna to be careful uh, with that and be aware of that. And that's why I like to take them straight to surgery because I like to anesthetize these patients as little as possible. Just walking over to see if there are any other questions. Okay, um, so we've confirmed our diagnosis and now we're gonna go to surgery and fix this. So how do we treat or how do we fix laryngeal paralysis? So your treatment options are going to be either medical or surgical. For medical management, we want to treat the acute respiratory distress using the things that we discussed before. So that's gonna be patient cooling, sedation, and keep the patient cool so often um, these dogs are not allowed to go for walks outside if there is, um, uh, if it's hot outside, that kind of thing. They cannot exercise outside. They have to be really, really uh, like leave a fa lead a fairly sedentary lifestyle. Um, so cooling, sedation, anti-inflammatories, and then the most important part of long-term management on these guys is weight loss. So you want these guys skinny and the reduction of body weight is gonna reduce the metabolic demands, which is gonna reduce the amount of oxygen they have to bring in. And it's going to um, uh, reduce the likelihood that they're gonna get into respiratory distress. So uh, manage acute respiratory distress, cooling, sedation, anti-inflammatories as needed, 
And then with, with long-term management, we want to definitely enforce weight loss. Now, as far as surgical options are concerned, there have been def several different procedures that have been described for management of laryngeal paralysis. Um, we have gone pretty much to almost exclusively a laryngeal tieback, unilateral. Okay, so laryngeal tieback, unilateral, only one side. You can pretty much guarantee aspiration pneumonia if you do a bilateral tieback. And that's the way they used to do them. But there was a study that showed between 60 and 70% aspiration pneumonia in those patients. So again, when we do unilateral laryngeal tieback, there are other things that you can do like a vocal cordectomy with or without, so plus or minus, what's called a castellated Laringa fissure. So when you look down the airway in these guys, you have the vocal folds here, the epiglottis is down here, and the retino retinoid cartilages are here. You'll find that the vocal folds are really what are obstructing the airway. And so by going in and just taking out the vocal folds, particularly on mildly affected dogs, you can significantly improve the clinical signs. And that has a lower risk of aspiration pneumonia postoperatively. So a vocal cordectomy um, is a reasonable way to manage mildly affected dogs, particularly if you're uncomfortable with doing laryngeal paralysis or a laryngeal tieback and you have, don't have the option for referral. Now, if I'm just doing a vocal cordectomy, I always do a ventral approach. So here's the thyroid cartilage like this. I'm gonna split the thyroid cartilage straight down the middle. And once I do that split, and then I put in Gelpie retractors like this, if this is rostral up here, so this is cranial or rostral, what you'll see is the vocal folds kind of like this inside the airway. And so we're gonna cut these back as far as we can and then just make sure that we suture the mucosal surface so that we don't get webbing postoperatively. And so that is an acceptable way to manage these in, in very mo or moderately to mildly affected dogs particularly if you are not comfortable doing a laryngeal tieback and you don't have the option for referral. Now, there's a paper that was um, written by Mark Smith in the 80s where he did what's called a castellated laryngeal fissure, laryngeal fissure. And what he did was, if this is the thyroid cartilage, when you make your incision in the thyroid cartilage, he would make this castellated um, uh, uh, incision and then take this tab on closure and move it up to here so that when you were finished, you had an appearance that looked like this. There was a hole here and then the other side kind of came down like this. And what it did was it increased the cross-sectional area of the remoglottidus to improve um, airflow. And so uh, Mark, even, even when we were residents, uh, and it was pretty well established that most people were doing uh, unilateral laryngeal tiebacks. Uh, Mark still did this castellated laryngeal fissure combined with the vocal cordectomy as well. So that's kind of a historical thing. I don't know anybody really that's doing castellated laryngeal fissure, although I will still sometimes do vocal cordectomy in some of these dogs, um, particularly ones where it's mild or moderate clinical signs and the owners are really, really concerned about uh, developing aspiration pneumonia. And then number three, you can do things like um, a retinoid ectomy, a, a, ret a retinoid ectomy, and a retinoid ectomy um, is where if you've got the retinoid cartilages here and the vocal folds here, you literally go in and remove a portion of the retinoid cartilage. I have never done this, and um, I think that it's associated with a fairly high risk of aspiration pneumonia.
All right, so that's not a procedure, that's more of historical significance. It's not something that I would recommend. And then I just read a paper this morning, which is on a laryngeal stent. Um, and they did this in seven dogs. And basically the stent is a silicone piece of tubing that has little nubs sticking out the side like this. And they just pop it down into the airway. And then just these nubs, the presence of these nubs um, keeps it in position. And they had reasonably good outcomes. And it was a very easy procedure to do much technically, much easier than um, uh, unilateral laryngeal tieback. And it might offer an opportunity or an option for uh, patients that don't have the option for uh, referral for a, a laryngeal tieback surgery. All right, so a stent is, is one thing that I saw. They did it in seven dogs and it seems to be, you know, okay. Now with laryngeal tieback, which is kind of the standard approach that most people take nowadays, um, what you are doing, if you look at the, if you look at the larynx from the left-hand side, and I always do left laryngeal tiebacks. And the reason why I do left is because the anatomy is kind of tricky. And so if I always go in the same way, um, uh, it's going to be easier for me because I'm going to be more uh, accustomed to the anatomy. And so unless I've got a fracture of the muscular process due to a previous laryngeal tieback, I'm always going to do a left-sided laryngeal tieback. All right, so looking at the larynx from the side, we have the retinoid cartilages like this. And then we have the muscular process of the retinoid cartilage here. Then we have the cricoid cartilage like this. And then you have the epiglottis here like this. And then you have the rest of the trachea back here. Now, the problem with laryngeal tieback surgery is that the way that the body protects itself from aspiration pneumonia, if you look at your larynx like this, you have the epiglottis that covers the airway when you swallow food. If you tie them back too far, you leave part of the rim of exposed and the epiglottis can't cover it. And so that's what causes aspiration pneumonia. And so just to review, the cricoretinoideus dorsalis muscle, which is right here, which is innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve right here, that muscle being paralyzed is what causes laryngeal paralysis. And so what we're doing is we're going in, let me just grab a different color pen. We're going in and putting in a muscle prosthesis, which is essentially a, um, let me just clarify this a little bit. So cricoid cartilage there, muscular process there. And then we're putting in a piece of suture through the muscular process and tying it around the back of the cricoid cartilage. And it's going to replace the function of the cricoarretinoideus uh, cric cricoa dorsalis muscle. All right, so that's, that's ultimately what we're doing. And we're just gonna kind of, kind of pull that back. If you pull it back too far, you're gonna get aspiration pneumonia. If you don't pull it back far enough, um, you're not gonna get resolution to clinical signs. And so it's kind of a tightrope um, how far you're gonna pull this thing back. Now, as far as specifics about the surgery, I do have a couple of good videos on uh, our YouTube channel, but um, just to review quickly, if this is the dog's neck here, and this is dorsally here, um, the jugular vein is here, which splits into the maxillary and linguafacial veins. And you can palpate kind of the thyroid cartilage right here. And so I always go back to palpating that thyroid cartilage when I'm making my approach. Um, and that's going to be my, you know, my landmark that I'm gonna to use to make my incision. So I'll start my surgical incision ventral to the jugular vein, okay? Right over the thyroid cartilage. And then I'm gonna dissect through the muscle, 
retract the jugular vein dorsally. And then what I'm gonna feel, the next thing I'm gonna feel is the dorsal aspect of the thyroid cartilage. And then there's a muscle, which is the thyropharyngeus, which is sitting on top of it. Now we used to transect the thyropharyngeus horizontally, but now what I do is I separate the fibers vertically like this. And the reason why I wanna separate them vertically is because I want to reduce the amount of dissection that I'm doing because I want to um, preserve the swallow reflex after, um, after the procedure. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna divide the fibers vertically. And then when I divide those vertically, you're gonna have some connective tissue, but you should be able to palpate in here the muscular process of the um, a retinoid cartilage. All right, so once I've gotten in there and I can feel the muscular process here and I can see the cricoretinoideus dorsalis muscle like this, I'm going to divide the cricoretinoideus dorsalis muscle like this. And usually what I'll do is I'll put a right angle forcep underneath it and then transect it using electric artery. And then once you've transected this and you're kind of looking at the CAD or the cricoretinoideus dorsalis muscle in cross section, it kind of looks like this. And then I'm going to dissect into the joint of the cricoretinoid joint using a periosteal elevator. And so once I do that, what you should see is the articular surface in the cricoid cartilage, and then the articular surface of the muscular process of the retinoid cartilage, like that. Now, once you've done that, we're going to pass a suture, and I usually use 2O proline, sorry, proline, and I'm gonna use two strands of that, and I'm gonna pass one around the back of the cricoid cartilage, and then I'm gonna pass it through the muscular process of the retinoid cartilage. Now the muscular, the articular surface of the muscular process of the retinoid cartilage is kind of pear-shaped. And so you wanna make sure that you pass your suture down ventrally, not dorsally. So ventrally is where it's widest. And so that's gonna give you the best purchase for your suture. And we're gonna run two of these sutures around the back of the cricoid cartilage. And then they usually exit right about here, like this, and then two sutures, again, through that muscular process. Now the tightness with which you tie these is absolutely critical in preventing aspiration pneumonia after surgery. And so remember that we already have an endotracheal tube inside the airway that's pushing open the larynx. And so you don't need to really crank this open. You just basically need to pull it very slightly, very slightly when we tie this. And one thing that can be helpful and that I do routinely is I'll tie my sutures and then I'll go in and do an oral examination and confirm that I'm happy with the amount of lateralization that I've done. Now, if you look down the airway and your so the retinoid cartilages are like this and your vocal folds are kind of like this. If you look down the airway, I'm happy with that. If I look down the airway and see that my retinoid cartilage is really pulled out like this, my vocal folds like that, that is too far and that's likely to get aspiration pneumonia. So I used to, when I first started doing this, I used to shoot for this appearance so that I'd try to turn them into athletes, but my aspiration pneumonia rate was quite high. Now, I just want them to be kind of sedentary dogs that are able to breathe even when it gets hot. And so I'm much more likely now to go with a more moderate or conservative approach on how far I tie these back. All right, so once I've done that, I've looked down the airway, I'm gonna close them up, um, just closing the muscle layers in the reverse order uh, that we did the approach. And then post-operatively, I'm only gonna use buprenorphine for pain relief. 
And I discharge my patients, if they're doing well, I discharge them the same day. I'm the only one in our practice that does that, but I can't remember the last time I've had an aspiration pneumonia. All right, so I discharge the same day because the, the anxiety and excitement that you get in hospital, I believe contributes to dyspnea and then the, uh, uh, the development of aspiration pneumonia. So I'm much more likely to send them home sooner. And then just, especially if you don't have 24 hour care in your hospital, uh, you definitely wanna send these guys home. All right, so when we send them home, the other thing that we do on our patients is we put them on gastroprotectant medications, I think meropotent, um, which is gonna reduce nausea, um, that kind of thing. And so that has been shown to reduce the likelihood of aspiration pneumonia. So what are our potential complications? So if we've done a laryngeal tieback surgery, the number one potential complication is aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonia is a life-threatening complica complication which occurs with some frequency. If you do a lot of laryngeal tiebacks, you are going to see aspiration pneumonia. The risk of aspiration pneumonia is reported to be somewhere between 10 and 60% um, with laryngeal tieback. Obviously, you don't want to be up at this end. If you're getting 60% aspiration pneumonia, there's a problem with the way that you're managing these. Um, I find that by sending them home same day, doing minimal um, dissection around the larynx um, and using acepromazine and buprenorphine or butorphanol, my rate is less than 10%, probably around 5% aspiration pneumonia. There was one study that showed as low as 3% aspiration pneumonia. So aspiration pneumonia is certainly not a guaranteed outcome. And especially if you're really careful with your anesthetics and your dissection, your risk of aspiration pneumonia should be fairly low. So aspiration pneumonia is the number one um, uh, concern with uh, laryngeal tieback surgery. So you wanna be careful with how you dissect in, how far back you pull them, uh, make sure that you're not operating with patients that, operating on patients that have pre-existing aspiration pneumonia, being really careful about operating on patients that have um, megasophagus or history of vomiting or regurgitation. Number two clinical sign is, or uh, complication is that you can have recurrence of clinical signs. Why does a recurrence occur? Either you have breakage of the suture or um, the suture can pull through the cartilage. If you have suture pull through or breakage of, the car, uh, breakage of the suture, you pretty much have to go around and do a right lateral laryngeal tieback, um, which is a little bit trickier anatomically just because you're not used to it. It's also harder if you're right-handed to pass that suture around the cricoid cartilage and through the muscular process. So you wanna be aware of recurrence of clinical signs. Number three is hematoma formation. And hematoma formation causes swelling in the airway, which can cause really severe dyspnea postoperatively. And so you want to be aware and be really careful with your hemostasis as you're doing the procedure. I've got a question up here. Um, the question, it's a question about whether meropinant contributes to analgesia. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not aware of that as being a, um, uh, characteristic of meropotent, um, but if anybody else knows that, let me know. So aspiration pneumonia, recurrence, hematoma formation. Um, remember that all of these dogs are going to have a voice change after surgery, because basically we're making it so that the vocal cords can't touch each other. Um, and so you wanna be aware of that and warn owners about that. The other thing is that some dogs will gag and retch when they're eating food because they can't adequately protect their airway. So again, to review complications, we've got aspiration, we have recurrence, we have hematoma. Uh, remember that you're gonna have progression of weakness in many patients, most patients, I would say. 
So I'm getting a phone call. Uh, you can have gagging when they swallow food. I think that's about it. Any other complications that you guys can think of? That's the only thing that comes to mind for me. All right. Um, so that being said, with all these potential complications, the success rate is reported to be around 90% with uh, laryngeal tieback surgery in dogs with um, laryngeal paralysis. So even in older dogs, and remember that this is a very minimal incision. I mean, the incision is only about this long once you get good at doing them. Pain after this surgery is very minimal. And so even in a dog that's 12 years of age, if it's healthy otherwise, I still believe that it's a candidate for laryngeal tieback surgery. That's pretty much all I have to say about laryngeal paralysis. Um, just be aware of it as a possible um, diagnosis in dogs that are uh, usually large breed dogs that are um, middle-aged or older, particularly in the spring and summer, uh, uh, progressive dyspnea associated with heat and exercise and that kind of thing. You make your diagnosis lose using history and physical examination. Uh, and then we're going to do a laryngeal examination under thiopental or low dose propofol or alfaxan. And then after you've made your diagnosis, then you can give your pre metabase promazine and butorphanol. And then uh, generally we do laryngeal tieback surgery as our uh, surgical treatment. Remember that if you have a patient that's obese, even if it has surgery, you still want that patient to lose weight because it's gonna recover more um, or better from the procedure. And also given the fact that a lot of these dogs that are gonna develop neurologic deficits down the road, you also want them to be skinny uh, so that they can handle that as well. So that's pretty much all I have to say. Please ask any questions that you have in the questions. Um, also note that this is free to everybody right now, but as soon as I get to my computer afterwards, I'm gonna um, make it members only. Uh, consider joining our YouTube membership. Um, the YouTube membership is something that we use just to kind of support the purchase of cameras and all the equipment that use for our, we use for our live streaming. Uh, with all of our Vet Dojo and our YouTube membership and stuff, we've never made any money in the, in the years that we've had it running. Um, so basically the YouTube membership is just kind of to try to recruit, recoup some of that um, money that we use for purchase of uh, cameras and equipment and stuff like that. And there's a lot of great content that you'll get on the YouTube membership that you can't get anywhere else. So thanks again for watching and we'll see you again soon.